Welcome back to Supreme Myths. I am so excited today to have as my guest Professor Victoria Nurse, uh, the Ralph uh, v. Whitworth Professor of Law at Georgetown University. Uh, she went to Stanford undergraduate, got her JD at Berkeley. She has worked in the private sector at Paul Weiss. She has worked on the Senate Iran Contra Committee, which is something I do want to <laughs> talk about at the end. Um, she has been the lawyer for the vice president, Vice President Biden, which sounds fascinating. We'll talk about that. She's been an appellate lawyer at DOJ. Um, she is one of the country's leading experts on statutory interpretation and, I think, constitutional interpretation. And her most recent book, Misreading Law, Misreading Democracy, I think is an absolute must read for everybody. Victoria, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, Eric, for having me. It's really uh, nice to get to chat uh, yes, with you today. The last time we saw each other was a night in Chicago where Judge Posner and Randy Barnett got into a fight. And I ended up writing about that for Harvard, and it was really fun. Um, I'm sorry, that was the year before mm -hmm. we met. The next year, you came to Chicago and gave a fantastic speech about your book. And uh, I hope we get to see each other in person sometime soon again. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that would be nicer. <laughs> we, all, we all want that. Um, so let's start with your book, Misreading Law, Misreading Democracy, because I think you did something in that book that in my 30 years of academia is extremely rare. You said something original and smart. And that's really hard to do. One can be smart and one can be not, you know, but and one can be original and dumb. But this is original and smart. Is there any way to capsulize kind of the essence or major thesis of the book? Oh, well, that's so nice of you to say. Wow. <laughs> you know, we academics think about five people read those books. So, um, <laughs> Well, obviously, there, there's a lot to be said from the title, which says yeah. misreading law, misreading democracy, because it's a response, of course, uh, to Justice Scalia's book, Reading Law. Yeah. Um, I think textualism misreads law. Um, and that's the point of the book. I think that uh, it deliberately uh, narrows the windows of interpretation in a way that um, makes it more likely that judges will be biased. Right. Uh, so I don't think it's textualism has been uh, sold on what is actually a truthful um, platform. <laughs> um, and the book goes through why legislative, what I call legislative evidence, not history, should be used in a difficult case. And it's probably the only um, defense of that, uh, an academic defense of that, that's, that's out there today. Well, that's what, yeah, and that's why I said it's original. But I have to say, to some substantial degree, you persuaded me, though I don't hold myself out as an expert necessarily on statutory interpretation as opposed to constitutional interpretation, which I do. Um, but so, so Justice Scalia, some of the people who watch this podcast are not lawyers and law professors. Justice Scalia famously said, don't use legislative history. Just don't touch it. Don't go near it. Mm -hmm. I won't use it. Mm -hmm. And he and he made that idea famous, I think, or at least, uh, yeah. yeah, I think he made that idea famous. And you take strong issue with that. So what, what are some of the faults of Justice Scalia's no legislative history dogma? Well, I think one of the problems is it's the only evidence outside of a judge's own mind that can actually check the judge. Okay. So Textualism purports to be a neutral um, way of looking at um, <clears throat> statutes, laws, or also the Constitution, as you said. You're absolutely yeah. right. Many of the things that I said in the book actually apply to constitutional law because yeah. the, the current form of originalism on the court is public meaning originalism, which is really textualism. So Heller, the case involving the right to bear arms, is a textual decision. So most of what I'm going to say here is about that. But there is one difference, you know, they'll look at the Federalist Papers, right? Originally, they'll look at the Federalist Papers, but they won't look at, so they'll look at 1787, but they're not going to look at 1987. And I find that very strange. Um, By the way, won't look if at I may, Congress just to interrupt said. quickly, not only is this strange, but to the best of my knowledge, I don't think Scalia ever defended that. Like, I mean, I, people called him on it throughout his life. I don't think he ever wrote, sat down and wrote something that said, here is why I look at 1787 Federalist Papers, but not 2003 right. legislative history. Right? I mean, I think that's right. Right. John Manning tried to. Yeah. And John Manning is an honest textualist. Um, uh, you know, he rejects using the separation of powers because there is no textual clause about that. He's right. an honest, he's the dean of the Harvard Law School. Yeah. He's an honest textualist, but he tried to pin down uh, Justice Scalia <laughs> in the conversation and it didn't really get anywhere. No. 
he didn't actually explain in that conversation, which is some symposium in a law review somewhere, yeah. Uh, yeah. about why he would actually look at what is the legislative history of the Constitution right. in 1787, at least some part of the legislative history. And uh, he wouldn't look at a similar document uh, in 1987 if he was trying to figure out what happened. I mean, you know, I don't know what happened. In, I can't remember what happened in 1987 <laughs> either. The question is, when you get into a situation where you don't know what the law means, are you going to look at all the evidence? Or are you going to look at part of it? Textualists sort of pick and choose. And in my latest article with Bill Eskridge, we call it gerrymandering the text. Yes. So they draw a circle around a part of the text. And um, they don't sometimes even read the full text, which, you know, at least read the full text. Um, that's part of the article. But it's also part of my uh, claim that we need to if it's focus on good evidence if you don't know what to do. You know, I was once nominated to be a judge. I'm not the most radical academic <laughs> out there. I like to solve problems. Um, and uh, by the way, you the should have, you should I, have been a judge. You were treated very unfairly, but that's a different story. We'll get into it. If that's a know. totally different yeah. story. But that's, I, I'm delighted. I got to be, you know, chief counsel to the vice president of the United States, who's now the president. So yeah. I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about my career. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I am a practical person. You know, some ap academics who I love are much more abstract. Yeah. So this is a practical problem. Statutory interpretation is one of the most important thing judges do because almost everything in law now is about a statute. The common law is dead, 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 as <laughs> Justice Scalia would say. So um, I think it's an important topic and it's one where you should look for evidence, all right? That's why I use the term legislative evidence. Right. So if there's no way you know what the meaning of the word, let's say sex is, which is a case which the Supreme Court just decided, yeah. did it include sexual orientation? That's a real problem for a judge. Do you just pick it out of thin air or do you look for some evidence? Well, originalists will look for evidence in the ratification debates and they'll look at the Federalist Papers, but they say, no, 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 we can't look at any legislative evidence involving what happened in 1991 or 1964. Um, and that's those are the dates of that statute, yeah. the Civil Rights Act. And I think that's problematic. It's not consistent. Um, and I also think that there that you can find good evidence. Um, there's a lot of bad evidence, and Scalia was right, there's a lot of bad evidence, but there's also decent evidence um, of what everyone agreed to. So it would be bipartisan evidence. And that's a way for a judge to say, no, I'm not making this decision. Does sex or discrimination against by sex include sexual orientation discrimination? Now, Justice Gorsuch, since he relied on the text, can only say, you know, he, oh, that was result oriented. His textualist buddies will probably say, right? Have said. Yes, they have said. Yeah. Um, yeah. But if he had looked at Bill and I argue in this article that if he had actually deployed the 1991 Civil Rights Act, I happened to actually be a baby lawyer um, on the floor of the Senate working with Biden at that time. It was a big bill. They were talking about sex stereotyping in the last amendment that was relevant to the case, which was they added a motivating factor. Right. Language to the statute, which is key, actually, to Gorsuch's opinion. So we think he would have had a much stronger opinion, a much more so-called neutral opinion if he actually looked at that evidence, because by 1991, the Congress knew and accepted Price Waterhouse, which was a case that the Supreme Court itself decided where sex stereotyping was right. the norm. That's how they were interpreting the term sex so that it included things like sexual harassment. Anyway, we think it would be stronger if you actually looked outside the judicial sphere and relied on good legislative evidence. So, um, you, you, you. One of the one of the most interesting parts of this book for me was how you alleged, and I think proved that most judges, most people, don't really understand the legislative process and how laws are made. We all have that. Uh, was it Sesame Street or whatever it was about how laws are made in our heads? Um, you you really take that on very directly. Can you say a few words about that? Because I found that fast. I thought I kind of knew how laws were made, but, right. but you kind of convinced me I didn't know as much as I thought I did, which is always a great thing in a book, by the way. Well, I'm I'm a lucky lady. I'm one of only five percent of people who've ever worked in a legislature who's actually a law professor. I know that's crazy. Isn't it? Um, it's a pretty elite group. Most law a lot of law professors have worked in the executive branch. Um, <laughs> you know, a lot of them career lit litigators, like I was, right, right, for the Justice Department. That's a classic track. Right. 
Um, and I think that experience great. It's just I have a different, you know, people who work in Congress, they go off and they become lobbyists and they earn a lot more money yes. than you get yes. in academia. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, th- th- there just is not that there aren't that many people. Right. But I had an experience and I had an experience with someone as a, somewhat unusual. Um, Joe Biden did a lot of legislation. Right. He was a legislator. Some people who are now elected don't want to do legislation, but he was. And I worked for the chairman of a powerful committee who'd been there a while. OK, so I got to see a lot of phases of the process and I got to know about it. And then when I got to the legal academy, I realized um, people really didn't understand this. I can't, I'll never forget. I took Jane Schachter. I was teaching at Wisconsin. She was teaching yeah. at Wisconsin. I was hired to do criminal law. So I know a lot about that. Um, taught that for a long time um because i'm a feminist so in my other life yeah. um, me too me too by the and, way. <laughs> yeah good <laughs> i'll someday i'll tell you the story about joe biden saying he was a, the first time he said he was a feminist but okay. that's another <laughs> i'll try to remember <laughs> another that story yeah. um so and jane schachter who's well known for her work on statutory interpretation was teaching statutory interpretation at the time and I took her to Washington and I introduced her to staffers and she just could not believe <laughs> the kinds of things coming out of their mouth. She's like, you work here? You know about this stuff? <laughs> and I said, yeah, yep. Yeah. And I know I know the vices and the virtues, okay? So I know that, you know, the power of politics, but I also know they actually operate by some rules. Now, they can waive all the rules if they want, but there's a process and you have to follow the process. If you looked at the impeachment, you noticed there was a process, right? And yeah. they made their arguments and all of that. Yeah. And so I brought that knowledge to statutory interpretation. And I argued that a lot of the way that legislative history had been done by liberals and conservatives alike. Um, so I indicted both Justice Stevens, who I love, <laughs> and Justice Rehnquist, who fought me on the Violence Against Women Act. So don't yeah. love him as much. Yeah. Um, you know, I indicted the opinions, very famous opinions written by both of them on the grounds that they really didn't understand how the process worked. So in one case, so the Weber case, Justice Rehnquist invoked people who had opposed the law. <laughs> now, that is really a, it's like signing a dissent as if it's the majority opinion. Right, it's crazy. And so I wrote an article in the Yale Law Journal about this, um, about, you know, legislative history by the rules. Um, and some people say, well, Senate, they don't follow the rules, but what I'm talking about is Congress 101, okay? Congress sort of, <clears throat> uh, the basic things you have to know, what's at the beginning, what's at the end. So for example, there's a case where Justice Scalia can't tell the difference between a committee report and a conference committee report. And one's the beginning of the process and one's at the end of the process. And so, they really don't. And it, it it happens to this day. I don't know how to solve this problem. If you've had any great ideas, you know, <laughs> you can send them on up to me. I've threatened to actually invite the Supreme Court clerks over to Georgetown so I can give them, a, you know, a five minute lecture. Hey, your, your but, colleague, Randy um, Barnett, gives them a two week lecture on originalism. Why can't you give them a one week lecture on statutory interpretation? I know. <laughs> I, I think it's just civics, you know, yeah. um, the chief justice got into hot water. Um, when I was working in the White House, I got a call from this former Senate parliamentarian. He had retired and he said, how can the chief justice have gotten it wrong in King versus Burwell when he wrote that the bill was passed by reconciliation? It actually wasn't. It was filibustered many, many times. Right. There were two separate bills. And, he, you know, this is the kind of thing as if they were fact checked. I was thinking about this the other day, you know, in my COVID haze, I was thinking, what can we do on the Internet? Maybe we should fact check the Supreme Court on these things. <laughs> Because they get it wrong, and it's kind of embarrassing, I think. Um, I agree with that. By the way, I think they get it wrong in constitutional law all the time as well and make demonstrably false statements all the time. And that's a problem. It is a problem. I mean, you know, in Heller, for example, there are a lot of people um, who've looked at the corpus linguistics, which is just a way of looking at how you use terms, yes. bear and arms, and come up with the exact opposite conclusion. And this is the problem with textualism. You're not looking at a lot of evidence. You're honing in on a small piece of a large thing, namely a constitution, right? right. And this is why Bill and I call it gerrymandering, because you're sort of drawing a circle around a district, namely a word, right? And then that becomes all important to you. Bear arms is everything. That it eliminates the rest of the Constitution, right? right? <laughs> it, it eliminates uh, the notion of precedent, which I think mostly textualism is, if it's 
theoretically what it's really being deployed to do right. is to aggressively reject liberal precedents. That's kind of the secret story of this. Um, honest textualists would also, I think, uh, admit that and Heller's a good example of this, but it happens in statutory interpretation, which used to follow a very strong rule of follow the precedent. So if we interpret the antitrust laws to mean X in 18, you know, 99, we're going to interpret them that same way in 1999. But um, now they are using textualism to say, well, no, maybe not, maybe not so much. Let me ask you a hard question about this. That that and and um, if I don't mention Judge Posner once, people get people. Well, they tease me for mentioning him too much. But I had a long conversation with him about the issues in Bostock when he wrote after he wrote his opinion in that case. Mm-hmm. Um, my question, and, and so Bostock raises the question, as you said, what does because of sex mean in Title VII? Um, but let's, whether it's 1991 or 1964, whatever year we pick, I think it's fair to say they, no one thought in 1964 it meant sexual orientation. I think that's a fair factual statement. And right. it's probably true in 1991. So how do we get what is I, I always thought it was fascinating that in the first three minutes of Bostock, the oral argument, Pam Carlin, one of my heroes, one of the great, I think, mm-hmm. citizens of our country, had to immediately, she was asked about Posner, and she immediately said, I'm not with him. My solution to this is not what Judge Posner did. Don't do what he did. What Judge Posner did is he said, words evolve, societies evolve. I have to deal with this today, not in 1964. Um, When it's an ambiguous word, a lot of time has changed and society has changed. What is the crucial time period in that case? Is it 1964, 1991, 2020? What is the time period that's relevant to the question, does because of sex include sexual orientation? Well, I think if you're an honest textualist, what you should say is it's the last time that the, the relevant language was amended by Congress. I mean, I'm a strong, you know, I call it a democratic constitutionalist theory. The, the legislature, however much this court calls it the legislative vortex, which is a misquotation of the Federalist Papers, <laughs> they just really don't like Congress. But you could hate Congress, but that's what democracy is. And so what I think is the relevant period, as I mentioned earlier, is 1991. Now, I don't think they included, I think people knew what sexual orientation was in 1991. I'm old enough to think that. I don't think they thought at the time, if people thought at the time they were actually including that. Um, that would have probably caused a tizzy. Uh, why? Because a lot of claims uh, involving feminism, Equal Rights Act, and you know, they had been lambasted by Reagan, et cetera, uh, and people had used women's causes, like the Violence Against Women Act was viewed as somehow strange in part because, oh my, it might lead to recognizing something about sexual orientation. And so all the advocates were, were <laughs> they used the L word on the floor in the 80s, you know, lesbian. <laughs> and I'm like, really? You really want people to be beat up? <laughs> you know, whoever they are. Yeah. So um, I actually think what it helps you do is, you know, there's something called the generality problem in interpretation. The generality problem is, well, it says sex, but how broadly or narrowly do you want to describe the, the, this statute? You could call all statutes, as Max Radin said, for justice. You know, <laughs> and so therefore that would give a lot of power to judges and a lot of power to Congress. So that's a real problem. I think one of the reasons I want to look at legislative evidence because because it helps solve that problem. Because um, you can see the level of generality that that a bipartisan group agreed that Price Waterhouse was correct, that sex stereotype, and this is a case where a woman was said she didn't wear pearls, okay? And so therefore she didn't become an accountant, I think is what it was, or a partner at an accounting firm, right? She was, you know, rough around the edges or something like that, <laughs> was not properly feminine, okay? Um, and it was femininity, right? Sex stereotyping that was the core of that case, and both sides said they agreed with that part of um, Price Waterhouse. And if they paid very close attention to cases in that, because the whole 1991 act was trying to reverse the Supreme Court. It was saying, you are trying to narrow these statutes. We have been trying to, and and that also helps you know, they were pushing back. The court had been narrowing and narrowing the race and sex discrimination <clears throat> statutes. 
And the whole 1991 act was to push back and say, no, we want, you know, a disparate impact test in this case. No, we want, you know, racial or whatever it was that they said. They were reversing a series of cases, but they that's why they made sure to say we actually like Pricewaterhouse. We like that interpretation. And that is in the congressional record. You, that's not in someone's head. It's not subjective. It's a piece of paper. It's right here. They said it. Um, and they agreed to it. So it's bipartisan. They did narrow the remedies, but that was a different thing. They had to say, oh, no, we think this is right, given that they were trying to overrule a whole bunch of other cases. And that gives you a level of generality that is more than just being female, right? It is something like sex stereotyping. And once you're at sex stereotyping, then you it makes perfect sense to say, well, you're looking at someone as their sexual orientation and you're saying that's not proper for a woman to be dating a woman or that's not proper for a man <laughs> to be dating a man. Um, and I think that 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 should give a judge comfort that they've identified the proper level of generality, because that's the real dispute between the majority, the Gorsuch's opinion and the Kavanaugh and Alito opinions, because they want to read sex quite narrowly to 1964 when it did mean, you know, ads about women do not apply, you know, um, and general, you know, discrimination against uh, females, people presenting. Uh, I have to say one thing about this case. Everyone kept talking about biology as the definition. We can't see anyone's biology. You know, discrimination is social. It's not medical. I once wrote a book about eugenics. So when people start talking about medical terms in <laughs> We discriminate based not on biology. We have no idea what the chromosomes are. Trust right. me, um, that I do know. So, so I, I, I'm a core legal realist, as, as core as they come today in today's academy. I would have fit in well in 1935. Um, so, here's <laughs> my one kind of uh, question, thought, worry about your approach, which is because I'm a core legal realist, I think that in all cases that judges care about and many they do not, but where they care, they're pretty much going to do what they want and they'll find a way to reach that result. Uh, I think mm -hmm. Gorsuch did what he did, not because of any theory of interpretation, but because it just so happens that about 65% of America think gays and lesbians should have equal rights at work. Mm -hmm. I think Gorsuch fits into that 65% of America, despite his conservative mm -hmm. credentials otherwise, um, and that's why mm -hmm. he did what he did. Um, you, by, by, by looking at all relevant what you call legislative evidence, I feel mm -hmm. like in most hard cases, judges will be able to find what they want to see uh, or, or mm -hmm. see what they want to find, I guess is a better way of putting that. And that makes – whereas I'd, I'd almost rather than take kind of a Posnerian honest approach. This is what I mm -hmm. think is the best result of this. I, that, that's open to me because it's vague. It's imprecise. Time has changed. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the best thing for the world. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, how do you, I'm curious what your thoughts about that are. Well, um, I'm certainly enough of a realist to say that the Supreme Court in cases like Bostock or cases, you know, involving the right to bear arms, yeah. that once it's politically salient, yeah. uh, it's going to be very hard for them not to vote with their, um, the party of their, yeah. <laughs> you know, the person or their own beliefs. Let's put it that way, because you talk about Gorsuch violating yeah. his party's, yeah. you know, views. He had to do that for some reason, right? And we can attribute all sorts of reasons. I think there are good reasons, though, and I would push back against too much realism. Um, most people do. So, I'm, because I think in most, there's a good empirical data from my colleague who runs the, um, or used to run the Georgetown Government Department, um, who's a serious empiricist. Basically showing that in the highly salient cases, yeah, you're right. But in the cases where it's, you know, rule 23 interpleader, <laughs> no one knows about it. No one cares. Right. Those cases, the doctrine matters and the method matters. OK, and those may actually have since people can't push back because they don't. It's part of the elite. Yeah. Right. These ideologies, which are and it is an ideology. Textualism is an ideology. Right. Uh, so I'm a realist about that as well. But the ideology can can push you in directions that you might not go. And then that's, you know. Yeah, I, I guess so. I'm, I, I'm criticized yeah. all the time. And that, now we'll move a little to constitutional law, but not. But, but it's, it's true of statutory interpretation, too. I'm criticized on Twitter and in academia all the time 
for ignoring the 60 to 70 percent of Supreme Court cases that don't raise politically salient issues or, or the fact that in the Court of Appeals, 95 percent of their cases, maybe 98, don't raise mm-hmm. issues that the judges are going to fight about because they don't care. Mm-hmm. My response to that is always, but we don't care either. I mean, I, I understand some people care about ERISA, and I understand some people <laughs> care about interplay and all that. Um, but that's not how we define our Supreme Court or even our courts of appeals. And I, I, I feel like if we agree that in the politically salient cases, legal realism is accurate, I don't have to really worry about the rest of it because I'm not claiming that politics or values decide cases where politics and values aren't in, you know, aren't, right. aren't in play. Um, I also, when we think about that, I also end that presentation with, of course, the Supreme Court is much too savvy and has always been much too savvy to take 70, 80, or back in the 60s, 150 abortion cases or affirmative action cases. They won't do that. They know if they do that, they'll be 5-4, now 6-3, on 90% of the cases. So they take 70, 80% of cases that they know the New York Times is going to write. Even Adam Liptak, as great as he is, is going to write one short column and it's over and it's done, you know? Um, so I, I guess I, I think that saying realism doesn't apply to cases we don't care about or most of us don't care about, I'm not sure detracts from my critique. Uh, Okay, no, no, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's devastating to your critique at all. It's just an explanation for those who might not understand, you know, what the facts on the ground are, because a lot of what judges do is kind of is boring. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's ERISA. Yeah. Now, ERISA does matter, you know, people's pensions. I, I know, I was, up I know. Years. <laughs> I need to care about pensions. I know. Uh, but- <laughs> I, Victoria, I mentioned that because Justice O'Connor, a year after her retirement, give or take, was at Georgia State, and a student asked her what kinds of cases do the justices not want to write on? And she, and she said a very terrible thing. She said ERISA, which isn't terrible so much. And then she said Native American cases, which I thought was a really terrible thing to say. Yeah, she said that. Um, but leaving that aside, um, you know. So they're hard. It's yeah. Because they're hard. That's what she said. That's what she said. That's exactly what she said. Um, mm-hmm. can we, let, let's move to constitutional law for one for like five or ten minutes. And then I want to really ask you about your work for Biden and for Iran-Contra. You wrote a fantastic article called Reclaiming the Constitutional Text from Originalism. Reclaiming the Constitutional Text from Originalism in the California mm-hmm. Law Review. Um, so I think you know this. I've written a piece that says the Supreme Court doesn't care about text, period, full stop. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I, for example, I'd like to ask Dean Manning where he finds the federal equal protection clause or where he finds the anti-commandeering clause or where he finds the sovereign immunity clause and all that stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. But your piece was was about executive power. And I love the way you destroyed Justice Scalia in about three paragraphs (laughs) in his dissent in Morrison versus Olson. So can you talk about that for a minute? Because I I just love that part of that article. I don't even know if I can remember that, except for um, there is, one, you know, his interpretation, which is beloved by conservatives, yes. um, because it has to do with the independent council, which is a totally different. We can talk about that, too. Yeah. But um, forget about the subject of the case. The way he wrote it was the text made me do it. This is what yes. I don't like about text. But personally, Bill and I talk a lot about this in the new piece because um, it's as if they've they've alienated themselves from their own moral judgment. <laughs> a long time ago, Andre Marmer argued that textualism was immoral because they weren't looking at the consequences of their action. And that, you know, that's one of the definitions of either mental illness or immorality. I think Posner th- thinks <laughs> um, that, but go ahead. Yeah. So anyway, I, I took him to task for his textual analysis because Justice Scalia in a very, you know, he has this, if, if textualism had a personality, it would be all about, I'm tough and I'm going to be <laughs> unflinching in my devotion to the text. <laughs> And I'm tough and I'm tough and I'm going to read this. And guess what? In the first part, he he says, oh, I'm going to follow the separation of powers. And guess what? There is no separation of powers clause in our Constitution. And that was deliberate, twice deliberate in the convention. Then when they tried to add it in the Bill of Rights, rejected. Why? My very first law review article, which you read the whole Federalist through, they didn't believe those clauses were worth anything. Parchment barrier. So he cites the Massachusetts Constitution. (laughs) That's not our constitution. What kind of textualism is that? <laughs> made, That's not made, point made up, number one. Made up. 
So point number two. So, you know, I, I've been studying the separation of powers since I was trying to understand Congress's role since the 90s. So I'm like, no, no. And then I'm go on to he has a very emphatic statement about executive power. And he wants to say the independent council law is unconstitutional because the president can't remove the independent council. That's a big issue for people in separation of powers. Let's not talk about that. What I was worried about was what he wrote. He said, well, that means I'm going to talk about the text and only the text. And guess what? It says the president must have all executive power. And that's not what it, what it says. Not what it says. <laughs> I am famous now on Twitter for this. Yeah. Uh, keep people keep <laughs> among our little group yeah. of people involved in this world. You know, the five people. Yeah. Um, but uh, it doesn't say that. Um, and it does say all legislative power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, the you know, I this is not good textualism. And in fact, in this new article, I, you've got to take a look at this. I'll send it to you. Bill wrote the first part of it. And it was all about the great cases of textualism, like the, the 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 hits. And he shows how each one of them, from Holy Trinity to this case called Sinclair to this other cases, that where the, the textualist judges miss the text. Right. Like they get the actual text. Forget about legislative evidence. That's <laughs> my thing. You have to wait to the end of the article for that. <laughs> he shows how they, 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 Frank Easterbrook doesn't read the full text, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's pretty devastating. He calls them incompetent textualists. <laughs> well, I think the first well, every historian, almost every historian that I know, has said that everything Scalia said in Heller about the history of the Second Amendment is basically wrong or incomplete or misleading. Um, he did that a lot. And that's one of my people who follow me know this. I can't, I've written so much about this. I just – the myth of Scalia, I think, is a hovering disaster for our country still today because he tended to oversimplify things in misleading ways exactly as you just said. I, I actually – because I worked for the Department of Justice on Iran-Contra against the Independent Council, um, I have some pretty strong feelings about the issues the Independent Council raises and I think they're serious and substantial. But one of them is not – that the Constitution says all the executive power. <laughs> it just doesn't say that. So a guy who, pr who prided himself over 30 years being you know, a textualist and an originalist, he gets it wrong all the time. I mean, this is Heller and, and Morrison are two examples. There are so many others. Does that say more about Scalia or more about textualism or originalism? Well, I think um – I don't know whether it says more about Scalia or, or textualism. I mean, I try to depersonalize this because textualism and originalism are now um, not because I don't think that he had a particular style that I, I reject. I mean, I, I made fun of this sort of we're tough, and, yes. you know, we're going to be unflinching and, you know what, we will follow the text because we're dead, strong. dead, dead. Yeah. yeah. And I'm, you know, it's catchy. It's I, but this is not what the average moderate judge would ever do. Right. The average moderate just does not want to say things like you chumps, which is a quote from the chief justice, because people have now copied this style. So I'll say and they're not as good at it as he was. Um, yeah. I think it's bad for judicial temperament. I think it's bad for um, America because it's deceptive. Um, it, it, it isn't candid judging, as you say. Now, I might not come to Posner's conclusion about what the proper thing is, but we both agree that it's not candid because they aren't following the text and they've kind of bamboozled people into thinking that. Um, and, and they bamboozled the entire current Supreme court. I mean, I commented on um, Amy Coney Barrett's nomination. She's a lovely person. She has seven children, like one of my best friends in Milwaukee, you know, she walks the walk. Um, I've debated her at Northwestern. She is super smart, but she is like kind of in thrall, you know, the, you know, it's kind of robotic in the sense that I'm going to repeat what Justice Scalia said. And I think people need to have a much more critical eye. Um, well, it and particularly the Academy has to be pushed back. The, the legend of Scalia I've been trying. is not a happy one. <laughs> I've been trying. It's um, uh, There's a great new book by Ed Purcell. That, well, 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 Rick Hasten wrote a very good book on Scalia. Rick was a little diplomatic. Um, Ed was not diplomatic. 
and called out Scalia for exactly what he was, which was a blowhard hypocrite. Sorry, you don't have to comment, but he was. Um, but he goes through his doctrines and his cases and shows there's no consistency uh, other than generally a conservative approach with some exceptions. Um, and uh, but, but one more question about originalism before we get to a few fun things and then we're running out of time. Um, I loved in that article the way that you took originalists to task for claiming to be textualists first, but they're really not at all. And the proof of that pudding, as I've been saying on Twitter now for 10 years, is so many doctrines today embraced by originalism have nothing to do with the text. And two friends of mine, Will Bode and Steve Sachs, who I've debated and written about and interacted with, and I love both of them. They're both great guys. But they are so wrong about this whole great powers idea that they, they want to limit they want to limit Congress in many ways based on a non-textual, I think, very dubious historical principle that has never been reflected in any text anywhere, any place, any time. And that happens all the time with originalists. When did we lose the text? When did originalists forget about text? Because they have. I think you showed that in your article and they have. Was there a time right, when, that, think- when that happened? I don't know if there's a time when that happened. I mean, as I said, in this new piece, uh, we're pretty much going back to the the greatest hits of textualism and showing they're not necessarily faithful to the text. I mean, all constitutional doctrine rules that courts make are added to meaning to the text. And I mean, there's huge amounts of doctrine with the First Amendment, for example, classic example. Um, You know, so you can't possibly confine it to the 4,000 or 6,000 uh, words. I don't think one of the things that I'm uh, just to shift the, the 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 focus. One of the things that I really <clears throat> like about your work is you're unflinching <laughs> in pushing back. Um, there are good textual arguments you can make. Um, I don't think they're ever enough, right? Because I don't want to. I don't want judges to lose lose some sense of what is justice or equity. Um, and that requires you to actually move beyond the text. It's by definition, equity is not textual. Yeah. That's what justice is. That's what statesmanship is like. Um, I don't want them to do that, but I think uh, I think people don't push back enough. Um, they're bullied by the tone. The reason I emphasize the tone, I'm not trying to make fun of Justice Scalia. He would go. He was very kind to Georgetown. Um, and he would talk to our students and he was very kind to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who's also like an icon of ours yeah. because her husband worked at Georgetown. So it's part of the family <laughs> in that sense. Uh, and I'm very hard on him. You know, I think the style is, is not appropriate for judicial temperament. Uh, I think people, um, but I do. And given that style though, I think that liberals can't just go neutral. You know, they can't just, right. one of the problems I have with like living originalism, I love Jack Balkan to death, but I think that's a bad strategy to push back on originalism by sort of saying, oh, you're just like us. Well, yeah, that's true, but it gives too much power to originalism um, and it just keeps repeating it. Instead, you I mean, I've taken a much more, as I said in that article, I think a more forceful lens trying to say, look, this isn't textualism. I mean, it's it's not candid. And, um, you know, well, what what a text. So I, I, I think that it's. Um, Hard to come up with solutions. That's what liberals need to do. I'm on this panel on ACS tonight. And one of the things my missions for the Harvard students is to um, come up with a new term to describe the kind of thing that liberals would want in, you know, to replace originalism. Because uh, Randy Barnett would concede that Scalia was not consistent. He called him a faint-hearted originalist or whatever. Well, hold on, hold, hold on that for a minute, because I made a big deal out of that in my book on originalism. And when I presented that at San Diego... Randy tried to explain why he said Scalia wasn't an originalist in the Taft lecture at Cincinnati, which was where Scalia called himself a faint-hearted originalist. But Randy claimed he was really mad at him because of Rach, and he was venting because of Rach. Now, I, I cannot get Randy to admit today publicly that Scalia wasn't an originalist. Maybe you can. But he, he doesn't deny it, but he doesn't embrace it, and he says he was mad. So I don't – you know, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, that's an interesting question. What should we call constitutional interpretation that we prefer? A, a word as snatchy as uh, or as catchy as originalism. Um, mm-hmm. I think that I, th- I I think that's a really important task. I'm glad you're on it. I I don't think though we're there yet because 
as hard as I've tried and as hard as Min- Jamal Green has tried and as hard as Mitch Berman has tried and, 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 and um, Peter mm-hmm. Smith and Tom Colby, who have written amazing things, we mm-hmm. can't get people to see there are no originals. There are no originalist judges. Scalia and Thomas voted – have both – have. Scalia votes to strike down over 130 laws. Thomas is somewhere in the same, you know, a little bit less than that. Very few of those were any originalist evidence presented by the justices. I mean, they're just, they're not originalists. So first we have to get people to see that. Then we can move to what we call the Constitution Accountability Center, which has great people who I love and, and politics I share. They're going about it all wrong. By same as Jack, by doing this liberal originalism thing, and you and I agree on this. We need I'm to. On your, I'm on your team on this. We one. need to write something um, about liberal I, originalism. I love her. <laughs> she's Elizabeth Weider's yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, force of nature. Yeah. I think she's doing a great job. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it's important to go, and I think we're at maybe at a turning point. I think students are hungry now for alternatives. The students coming to Georgetown now. Obviously, we've got because of Randy and Larry Solom was there, yeah. who's his theorist. You know, yeah. he's now gone to Virginia. But we have a tradition of, of you know, eclectic thought. We've got Robin West, who's right. a, you know, right. a world class feminist yeah. and constitutional theorist. Yeah. And then we have Randy Barnett. Yeah. And some of the students come for that. But I think that liberals really need to push back harder. I, I think the students now are, are trending toward more towards social justice. Maybe it's because the events in their lives. And I think that may be part of the impetus uh, for ACS chapters to get more involved in this. I used to go to the Federal Society all the time before Trump because they were the only people talking about this. And one of the things I'd like to see ACS do more of and the students be more uh, engaged in these kinds of programs which is why I do it. You know, I don't I got a few other things to do. I'm yeah. writing a, a book on impeachment. You're a little busy. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. I, I think it's really important for students to understand it. And I think people need to keep keep at this. No one's really an originalist because yes. they aren't. I, I did they a debate aren't. with um, Elan Werman for the Federalist Society on a Friday night called Friday Night Frights. There were 700 students on, on Zoom. You know, um, ACS needs to figure – I'm a board member of you know, Daniel, Georgia. We have to figure out a way to do that. All right, I want to get kind of less serious for just – we've got 10 minutes left. Um, what's Joe Biden like? <laughs> You've worked with him very closely, right? I mean, you were you were his lawyer when he was vice president for a year, right? Yeah. What's he? Can you just now? Nah, we're getting into Oprah stuff, but what's he like? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm certainly biased. You know, yeah. I worked for him in the '90s yeah. on the Senate Judiciary Committee, um, and I was really honored. You know, I couldn't tell anyone at the time that his son was dying. They wanted an old hand in there. Right. I mean, I was hired by Ron Klain, who's now his chief yeah. <laughs> yeah. staff. Yeah. Um, and so I go back to the old days, the days that where he was legislating, where we did the Violence Against Women Act. Um, and I was able to do it. You know, I'm an academic, so I could. And Georgetown's very, yeah. you know, used to people. So yeah. I've got to go do something in yes. government. <laughs> yeah. um, and we have a cast of thousands. Like, you couldn't do this at Wisconsin. Right. So um, I couldn't tell anyone. I couldn't even tell my family. It was very, it was both an honor. Like, you know, sure. we know you're not just an egghead. You can do something <laughs> real. <laughs> and... Um, but he's he's the real deal. You know, I hate to say this. He has not a great reputation among the New York Times. All of the people who've worked for Joe think that they don't treat him very fairly. He's a very smart guy and he's all hard. OK, so, um, so he is. I guess what you see is what you that's get. That's what I wanted to ask. Well, that's that's refreshing <laughs> in politics, I think. Um, all right. Um, he, is. I think he learned a long time ago that life was, you know, this goes with the tragedy thing about him. You know, his former chief of staff said he's the luckiest and unluckiest yeah. person in America. Yeah. And I think those things made him um, care very much about public service, getting something done. He's a very urgent guy. I mean, I got two weeks to write the entire Violence Against Women Act, you know, only because we were in a recess. <laughs> right. um, so he's he's the real deal. And he's very, um, it, you have to be yourself. And sometimes, you know, things, he gets criticized for those things. And he's fine with that. He got used to it because it wasn't really that, it doesn't matter to him. It wasn't his family. It wasn't his Reputation in the Senate was very different than what the. Right. I, I, I was critical of, Demo- of of Democrats picking him to run against Trump, but in retrospect, I was wrong, and I admit that. I think his sense of decency is what did it. I mean, I think it certainly wasn't his oratory or anything. But and I don't think anyone who'd ever met him in the Senate would not say that. I yeah. mean, I, he he built relationships, and yeah. that doesn't mean he didn't stand up. So, for example. We knew Jesse Helms was going to filibuster the Violence Against Women Act, right? right? And he could have dropped the parts that Jesse didn't want just to 
And he was like, no, I'm not going to cave to Jesse. (laughs) So I negotiated. He would give me to Orrin Hatch to negotiate and whatever. He tried, but he wouldn't give up the things that he cared about. And, you know, just trying made him seem better than other people who, you know, some liberals, are just like some conservatives, are, you know, sneer at the other side. They treat the other side as like yeah. the enemy. Yeah, especially today. That's never been his style. Never been his style. You know, when I hear you talk about those kind of things, um, I, I, I spent four years at DOJ, but I was very lucky in litigating front page constitutional law cases for those four years. So when I teach constitutional law, I really tell the students – on the ground lawyering things about, for example, we had a big church state case involving aid to parochial schools. And we litigated that case in the district court for the sole purpose of getting Justice O'Connor's vote eventually. Like that's, I mean, it was all about Justice O'Connor and getting her vote because we knew these cases were going to the Supreme Court eventually, probably. People, Anyway, mm-hmm. the way you talk about Congress, um, you should be on a court. Because because you understand, I mean, it feels to me like like judges should understand Congress a lot better than they do, um, and 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 yeah. academics. So when you teach statutory interpretation, it's not just theoretics for you. Like, how mad were you when the Violence Against Women's Act was struck down by the Supreme Court? I imagine. I mean, I was really mad because of politics. You had a personal well, thing going on. Yeah, well, let me just tell you about how real Joe Biden is. He sat in the front. I didn't go to the oral argument because I was six months pregnant with my daughter. Right. The, and uh, uh, he sat in the front row and looked right at Chief Justice Rehnquist. Why? Because Rehnquist had lobbied against the act. This is public. This has been made public by other people who've written about yeah. uh, this. It's not just me saying this. You can go look it up. <laughs> Judith Resnick at Yale. But he lobbied. Um, in fact, I had a, to do an on-bank <laughs> thing in Bob Dole's office at one point among with all these judges. They didn't know I'd been an appellate lawyer. They thought I had bamboozled. I was some radical feminist who had bamboozled <laughs> the idiot Biden into doing this. And right. of course, they're totally wrong. They were totally wrong. This was Joe's thing. I could never, yeah, it was just some young staffer with some, you know, Ron Klain and I had some bright ideas, you know. <laughs> and I was trying to make the best possible legal case. So we relied on Heart of Atlanta, right? Yep. The basic case that said set the terms of the commerce power very broadly, right? Rational basis. If Congress has a rational basis, meaning a a record that's decent, you can do this. And so that's what the constitutional law law was. That's what I wrote. Um, And Biden, you know, people don't realize he actually, um, he taught constitutional law on the weekend. Again, workaholic guy goes up there to Delaware. And then on Saturdays at the University of Delaware has a seminar wow. on constitutional law. Why? Because he has to do it for confirmations. Right. He has to do it for Bork. Right. He has to do it. So he knew the constitutional law. Right. I'll remember. Um, so Ron would say heart of Atlanta. And we'd all say heart of Atlanta. And he knew exactly what we we're talking about, which is this broad standard. Congress has great leeway. By the way, that hotel is two blocks from my law, was two blocks from my law school. Oh wow! Yeah, when I, te- when I teach it, I po- when I teach when I teach Heart of Atlanta, I point, and I say this hotel was right out the window, right there. It's kind of cool. Well, and so anyway, we didn't expect the law when we wrote it was in our favor, but of course then, um, and I am also writing a book on this, but it's the pandemic. Uh, Lopez came down. Yeah. Lopez was written to kill Morrison, in my opinion. They created a whole new test. They tra- our Heart of Atlanta's out. Now we have a test. It can't be about crime. Right. <laughs> <laughs> There's a new test. And um, they knew that they couldn't. Re- Rehnquist knew because he was on the record. I mean, this was reported in the news and he gave it as his end of the year speech that he opposed the Violence Against Women Act civil rights remedy. Um, and I don't think they would do this now because they've been in, you know, the, the, <laughs> at the time, no one seemed to think this was a problem of him lobbying, but it made Joe Biden very angry. It made me very angry. It made me distrust the judiciary. Sure. Um, and so it was not, I mean, when I saw Lopez, I was actually teaching at Wisconsin and I knew that it was over. So that was decided in 95, I think, or 96. So I knew we were going to lose, but you know, the good news is we got a great opinion out of Justice Souter, hardly the person you would have thought to be a radical feminist. (laughs) I actually, I was at DOJ when he was nominated and all the conservatives, yes. And all the conservatives were... Um, very upset because they thought I'm forgetting the governor's name from 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 his state, who was Bush's chief of staff. I'm having a senior moment, but oh, Sununu, Sununu, yeah. People knew that Sununu was really morally pretty liberal, like he, compared to the Republican Party. He was, and, and, but but my thing was, Souter was living at home with his mom. 
I studied him a little bit on the Supreme Court. I knew he was going to be that. It was just obvious, and I, and I, and I took great pleasure <laughs> at the Department of Justice in predicting that, and I was glad that I was right. Um, I, I'm not surprised he's, he's a radical. Also of Warren Rudman. Warren Rudman, after Iran-Contra, went to work for my old law firm, Paul Weiss. Um, which is a very liberal well, law firm traditionally. He became friends, good friends with Arthur Lyman, who was yeah, a great new yeah. lawyer who brought me to Washington. And um, well, speaking of Iran Warren Contra, was, sorry, we, we have only five minutes left, and I, and I oh, really sorry, want to ahead. ask you about Iran Contra because I worked on it okay. a lot. No, I worked on it for the Bush administration. Everything I'm saying is public. Not this is not part of my litigation with them, um, mm -hmm. but I know Iran Contra. Why isn't okay. it? It's like it's been lost to American history. And to me, it is one of the, it is still, I think, the biggest executive, I don't know, I'm not, I had to get some distance from the Trump years, but it's the biggest executive branch scandal I know about uh, from top to bottom. You worked on the Senate committee investigating it. Any mm -hmm. theories why it's just been lost to American history? Um, the, the, the offense was made too complex for the media. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, I, and this was a fault of my boss. You know, he was a brilliant lawyer, brilliant prosecutor. His son is now on the bench. Um, and, you know, Arthur Lyman was so beloved in New York. Um, but he didn't really understand the media. And, of course, the media didn't treat him very well during the hearings. I mean, I only know this because of post hoc things I did in Washington when I worked for Biden. It became clear to me that the media could spin a story which is incredibly different than what you experienced being in the room. Um, of a highly, yeah. you know, charged event. And I don't think, you know, the diver they called it the diversion, which, you know, there was missiles and then there was freedom fighters in Nicaragua. And so there's no simple explanation about why, um, what was wrong. Now, I thought Ali North stole <laughs> money from the federal government personally. <laughs> and I thought theft was an offense. And I th he passed cash in the EEOB. I mean, that's where I used to work in the White House. And this is like the White House White House, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. where the VP's office is. Yeah. And he's in the basement passing a cash? Like, right. no. Well, that's what I mean. It's a terrible and, it's, and doesn't, you know. Uh, so Bush pardoning Weinberger has been lost to history. And even Lawrence Walsh says that was the biggest, one of the biggest cover-ups in American history because Weinberger, according to Walsh, not Siegel, was possibly going to incriminate Bush when he was vice president. So Bush was, in effect, pardoning himself to some degree. And that whole episode well, has been lost. We never taught. I mean, it's just, I, don't, I, I doubt it's taught in high schools. I have no idea. But I doubt that it's taught in high schools. I find it right. Whole thing. I agree with you that it's it's actually something that that people need to, um, in hindsight, remember because yeah. it's very uh, you know unfortunately the president has a lot of power. We saw this with Trump, and they can do things. I mean, you know, I I'm very curious, for example, um, to see what what we if anything we can find out about what happened in the last days of the Trump presidency. Yeah. Um, as I said, I'm writing a book on because I was a PBS commentator. I'd watched this all, and yes. it was, and it's actually very disturbing to me because I think that the theories of the Reagan administration and the Bush administration, and I work for George H. W. Bush as a career lawyer yeah. um, too, and I, I like the guy, um, but I do think the theories that were built up, the theories of originalism at this time by Stephen Calabresi, who I know is a nice man, disagree violently with this. Originalism, textualism, and the unitary executive, they're all of a piece. Yeah. And they and that's part of this story. They really believed that they were allowed to do this kind of stuff. And they should be. And that there was no real wrong there. Put your memo later on, same thing. It and if it's if people don't push back on this, yeah. Um, you know, I know we all want the Justice Department to be neutral right now. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, when things are like that, I think that, you know, I th I'm happy you brought this up. But you're the only person I know who actually uh, <clears throat> understands this. Yeah. Uh, I think even my dean who worked for Lawrence Walsh doesn't really talk very much about Iran-Contra. And it is a story that's been lost to history. And um, my, 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 it's too bad because there was a theft. I mean, there was corruption yeah. and theft. Uh, well, and, and, and illegal and illegal and proven illegal. I mean, and the president taking too much power. And then they covered it up, you know, with yeah. Poindexter. And yeah. that. They tried to write memos that he had never signed yeah. and, you know, all this that Reagan hadn't signed. So they tried to cover this up. And 
But I think they believed it was proper from a perspective, a legal perspective as well. And I think that's also the story that hasn't been told. My little piece, well. my little piece of it was the National Archives got a subpoena from Walsh for Reagan's presidential documents. This is 1990, I think, or 89. Um, and, and my job was to represent the National Archives in that subpoena dispute. And their position was the Presidential Recording Act doesn't let us give anybody these papers. Right. We can't give them to anybody. And the independent counsel's position was, we're not anybody, we get them. And, 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 and the interesting thing about it, which you might find interesting, I, I don't, this is not, I'm not disclosing anything illegal here. Um, we had a surefire defense under the Presidential Recording Act, but mm-hmm. the politicos didn't want to use it because Bush was running for president and it sounded like executive privilege. It wasn't executive privilege, but it sounded right. like it. And what I learned from that whole lesson, the reason I brought it up, um, at least as far as I can tell, in, both, in, in the, both parties all the time, reality takes a second seat to what it looks like all the time. How is it going to be perceived? What's the media going to do with it? And that's just, I wish it wasn't that way. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of a utopian in that sense. I wish we can get away from appearances and get to substance. One of the things I love about your work, I mean this sincerely, is I think you get to the substance very quickly and you brush aside what should be brushed aside, um, which is why you should be in politics, not at Georgetown Law School, uh, as a judge or a congressperson or a senator or something. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for doing this, Victoria. It was so nice to see you. Um, well, it's nice to see you. And I, this was the highlight of my day. Uh, well, so. um, well, well, I hope you inspire some students tonight to think of new terms for, for originalism. Yep. Um, I, I've been doing originalism for a- ACS for a long time now from a critique perspective. But you're, right. Ru- but you're right. We need a build. We need, we it, need needs a, a, it needs a brand because yeah. Randy will say, oh, you can't fight. You can't win something if you don't have your own your brand. You know, theory. I, and I personally think living constitutionalism is, is, is a bad slogan because it's not really what David Strauss wrote about, which I agree. is common law constitutionalism. I agree. And it also seems to suggest that people can just make up things. And I just don't think it's a good slogan. Well, it's not that it doesn't, might not be right in the sense that, yes, the Constitution changes. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be me. But, I wouldn't be me if I didn't say we could solve all of these problems by recognizing the Supreme Court is not a court. And it's justices are not judges, but that's a different conversation for a different, a, different a different day. Thank you so much. I really appreciated this.